Hi, <laughs> my name is Shah. My, my notes are like, remember to say your name. <laughs> um, as Guy has covered and, has, and as we've seen, uh, we are in a precarious time where rentier capitalism has disenfranchised entire swaths of the workforce. We've also seen how our tools and infrastructures shape the stories we all tell and the stories that we have access to. From protesters in Cairo using laser pointers to disrupt military helicopters, to the Turkish Prime Minister using Apple's end-to-end -end encrypted FaceTime to rally against the recent attempted coup, this is a time of protest, what Guy talks about as uh, a stage of revolt. And this is more of a meander than a talk, but I want to walk through a few different stories today, uh, stories of protest and infrastructure. The infrastructure of protest, uh, the structures and communities that support these types of protests, and the protest of infrastructure, uh, the pushback against these systematic shifts in technologies and displacements of labor. In order to imagine our future in this environment of protest as designers, as writers, as uh, engineers, I find it useful to remember the past. Because of the rise in the US of the Black Lives Matter movement protesting police brutality, I am often reminded of the story of racial desegregation in the American South in the 1950s. In school in the US, we're often taught about the bravery of Rosa Parks, a black woman who removed, uh, refused to move from her seat to sit in the black section in the back of the bus. Rosa Parks, for us, is a heroic figure, a neat narrative of individual protest that resulted in a sort of systematic justice. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, it, it's important for me, though, to, to understand how the Montgomery bus boycott that resulted happened, uh, just how many people were involved. In 1955, all the transportation in Montgomery, Alabama was segregated. And by segregation here, I don't mean uh, a willful and polite segregation between black and white. Uh, all buses in Montgomery reserved the first four rows uh, for white passengers. Uh, buses running through black neighborhoods often ran crowded in the back, people standing uh, without any space uh, and empty in the front. There were, there were cruel jokes played during these times. Uh, the the all-white drivers in Montgomery uh, used to play cruel jokes on these black passengers. Uh, since the fares needed to be de deposited in the front of the bus uh, and the black rider had to re-enter from the rear, uh, the joke was to wait until they had left the bus and then drive off, uh, leaving them uh, stranded in the street. Rosa Parks was an activist and had been a victim of that joke before. Uh, on December 1st, 1955, when she was arrested for sitting in the seats reserved for whites, she was already the fourth black woman to be arrested for this crime in Montgomery. The rally behind her and the decision to boycott the buses that followed was organized and communicated by an entire community of civil rights activists, uh, church leaders, sympathetic white journalists and lawyers, and a young minister named Martin Luther King Jr. On December 5th, the day of the, the first day of the boycott, Dr. King and his wife Coretta woke up at dawn to see if their efforts at organizing the boycott were successful. And what they saw astounded them. First, all they saw were buses riding by, empty. And slowly, uh, over the course of the morning, the sidewalks filled with black pedestrians. Tens of thousands of people boycotted the buses that day. Uh, 
People hitchhiked with friends and neighbors, rolled, rode mules, <laughs> and sang in groups on the way to work. They continued on like this every day. And there were so, so many people involved. To offset the burden, black-owned taxi companies offered free rides. Uh, car owners organized massive carpools through church gatherings and message boards. White housewives began to drive black passengers they claimed as housemaids or cooks. A week after the boycott began, thousands of leaflets were distributed through an informal network of, uh, uh, of 40 pickup locations throughout the city. Uh, and as news spread across the country, donations collected from black and white families across the nation were used to buy more cars, more station wagons, to serve the community. To mask where the donations were coming from, people started organizations called From Nowhere, uh, or In Friendship. Volunteers, including Rosa Parks, became fleet dispatchers. Uh, folks with cars would call in, register the times they were available for that day, from where and when, and would be directed by dispatchers on where to, where to meet and where to take people home. With hundreds of cars, the ride-sharing network that grew out of the boycott became an infrastructure that was e in some places even more adaptive than the bus lines being protested themselves. The boycott lasted for 381 days. <laughs> 381 days before the Supreme Court of the United States ruled the bus segregation unconstitutional. More than an entire year of self-organized community protests involving activists and lawyers, cab drivers, workers, and housewives. It's hard for me to imagine the scope of this boycott. Tens of thousands with their daily and nightly self-determination. Harder still to imagine the bombings, arrests, and threats that many people in Montgomery faced during that year and afterwards. But what I keep wondering is, how do you address these systematic inequalities that aren't visible? How do you protest something that sows rifts into people's lives over decades? When systems fail communities, how do we respond? Who do we blame? How do we recover? This is where the story of healthcare.gov begins. The, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act uh, was signed into law by Obama, so known as Obamacare in 2010, and it was the most significant overhaul of America's healthcare in almost 50 years. Feels sad to talk about in a country like Sweden, uh, but the United States health insurance has been drifting off the charts for about 30 years now. Uh, in 2010, the United States spent almost twice per capita of what Sweden spends, um, and still had a much lower average life expectancy. Almost 50 million Americans were uninsured in 2010. Primarily, these were made up of the poor white, Hispanic, and black uh, households. By any estimates, between 25,000 and 50,000 Americans died prematurely every single year because of their lack of access to health care. And countless others were bankrupted by a single illness uh, or, or a single emergency. The Affordable Care Act was a huge change, and healthcare.gov was created as a central place to enroll in health care. On October 1st, 2013, the healthcare marketplace on uh, healthcare.gov launched and immediately began to face issues. Initially, people thought that the website was experiencing these issues because of the overwhelming demand, uh, because there was. In the first 24 hours alone, almost 5 million people visited healthcare.gov. Uh, that's the population of Norway. Uh, and, but within those 24 hours, only six people were able to sign up. Uh, As the days went by, people inside and out began to realize that the problems the website were facing were not just because of demand, but because of massive failures in terms of internal architecture, engineering, and design. Uh, 
By the end of October, Obama had tapped Todd Park, then the White House CTO, to lead the charge for what they called a tech surge, uh, pulling people from the tech industry in to help fix healthcare.gov. The people that came together did not all know each other, but we grew to. Many people took leave from comfortable jobs at large companies. Many left their homes altogether to live out of the same hotel an hour or so outside of Washington, D.C. And we worked uh, in conference rooms, hotel rooms, and restaurants. Together, we were able to replace entire portions of healthcare.gov, redesigning and re-engineering the application experience. We dropped the average time to submit an application in half and removed almost 80% of the steps for a majority of people. And though there's been a lot of news articles and group photos and, uh, and things about the tech surge, there were no heroes here. The work involved was part of an incredibly long conversation. Uh, there were countless people working at all levels of the government, from the field office workers to the requirements and policy people to the politicians. Thousands of volunteers assisted households in nonprofit facilities all across the country. Almost 17,000 call center representatives supported the healthcare.gov call centers during that first year, sometimes fielding a quarter of a million calls in a single day. By the end of the first open enrollment period, six months later, uh, we went from six people that first day to over eight million uh, enrolled in healthcare. It has been, without a doubt, the most important work I have worked on in my life. And since then, we have kind of, our team has continued our work by forming a public benefit corporation called NAVA, working to improve healthcare.gov as well as working with other agencies to redesign and reimagine their digital services. Because though healthcare.gov is a clear and powerful and easy narrative, there is far, far more work to do. It's an important point for us to underline and remember because the systems and services that we work on are fundamentally not failures of design or engineering. They are failures of respect. Uh, they are failures of access. As government services digitize, a broken website is functionally a broken service. For that reason, we've been careful about how we design not just our work, but our organization. We formed our company as a public benefit corporation, a relatively new designation in the U.S. of a company that weighs a social mission at the same level as uh, delivering shareholder value. We've been building NAVA as a counterpoint to much of the volatility and strange incentives uh, we see in tech these days. Instead of the infamous old Facebook mantra, move fast and break things, NAVA's goal is a little more like this, uh, moving fast, and fixing things. We say this to ourselves and we say this to each other because our work runs deep, has implications far beyond what we imagine. We say this because the infrastructure has on services, the, the impacts that infrastructure has on services can be drastic, can dra radically change markets, communities, and demographics. I took a break a couple summers ago before we started NAVA after that first year to f see a very different kind of infrastructure. It was an expedition run by Kate Davies and Liam Young, speaking in the other room, turns out, uh, a studio they called the Unknown Fields Division. Uh, our goal there was to trace the supply chains that we all depend on these days, to imagine and encounter the infrastructure that supports us. We sailed from Hong Kong to, uh, so from Saigon to Hong Kong on this ship, uh, the Gunhilde Maersk, a ship about twice as long as the turning torso is tall, that held hundreds and thousands of tons of cargo, that had a crew all told of about 15 people. And I kept thinking about on the trip was the steps that brought us to this infrastructure that we rely on these days. How containerization was another example of technology enabling all these things we take for granted, but also displacing an entire class of work. Uh, 
Up until the 60s, we shipped goods through a method called break bulk shipping. Uh, longshoremen on the docks loading and unloading cargo of varying sizes. Dock workers' lives were both unique and exhausting. Though they were paid more than most other workers, uh, their shifts were irregular. Uh, most dock workers enjoyed the flexibility, though, you know, if they, on a random day, decided to go fishing, they were able to. Uh, it's funny, but not surprising to see the echoes of today's on-demand labor in these sentiments. But when the standardized shipping container system was born, a product of Malcolm McLean's Sealand Corporation and San Francisco's Matson Corporation, the entire dock worker class was threatened, and a debate, a huge debate, emerged. And it's important to note that the concerns that automation raised weren't just local ones, but national ones. The conflicts that resulted were both fierce and fractured, uh, but the labor unions on the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States were able to form incredibly strong resistance. Two major agreements were reached between the shipping companies and the dock workers. In the Bay Area, the Mechanization and Modernization Agreement forced shipping companies to pay $5 million a year into funds that would pay for early retirement, disability benefits, and wage supplements to the displaced longshoremen. On the East Coast, the, the ILA was able to negotiate a royalty payment for every container passing through New York, using the funds to pay longshoremen a guaranteed annual income, uh, which would be paid until retirement. It was a huge victory at the time, but these agreements that started in the Bay Area and New York are seen as rare exceptions now in the US. Uh, the idea that employers pushing for automation or displacing entire classes of labor need to distribute profits back to these people, that, that idea has evaporated uh, along with the jobs. In just 10 years after these agreements, longshore labor went from over a million jobs to less than 100,000. New ports were constructed near San Francisco and Oakland and near New York and New Jersey to accommodate the container ships, these much larger vehicles, and took the industry with them. There are no simple stories here. I can't argue that shipping containers should still be loaded by hand, nor can I argue that the labor unions always acted in good faith. There are many factors that influence the shape and weight of city centers, and containerization was only one of them. But I think about this a lot when I place, visit places like here, like Malmo, uh, a harbor city home to many of the early labor movements in Sweden, that watched this industrial labor force increase by half from the 60s to the 80s. The industrial labor that evaporated from cities like Malmo, San Francisco, and New York uh, from the 60s to the 80s reshaped these waterfronts. Uh, it's wild to see these cities being reshaped again by the digital platforms and infrastructures we build today. The tech scene in Silicon Valley these days is in its own precarious period of a full-on sort of tech rococo, uh, with billions of dollars in capital funding huge private enterprises. There are now hundreds of companies leveraging precarious labor as a commodity material. And thanks to companies like Airbnb and Dropbox, we now have a term like unicorn, uh, which refers to private companies that have over a billion dollar valuation. And sometimes I forget uh, that scale, square, magic, medium, sunrise, karma, and clear were words at all, not companies. Even, even is a startup now, and I, <laughs> I just, I, yeah. <laughs> the venture capital model, which depends on massive scales of growth and the disconnection between precariat labor and the tech people who profit off of them, creates surreal incentives, uh, cruel gaps. These surreal incentives are what cause Uber to desperately buy more drivers onto their platform brokering leases for people, making them rent ac their access to a platform that doesn't treat them as an employee, saddling them with loans and enforcing them with remote kill switches on the cars. These surreal incentives are what cause Uber to reinvent sharecropping. <laughs> 
These are cruel jokes. Nothing like the informal ride-sharing network of the Montgomery bus boycott. It's easy for me to get angry here, to call for protest. But the work to be done takes on many, many forms. Sometimes protest looks like creating support structures for your communities, like the Black Panthers did by feeding uh, 10,000 kids breakfast every day across the nation. Sometimes protest is just the practice of doing the work itself, where the Center for Independent Living uh, movement in Berkeley used hammers to break to do break the curb cuts into the sidewalks. Sometimes protest means letting others have the spotlight, and sometimes it means standing alone. But still, protest does not adequately describe to me the the running of an alternative transportation network for an entire year, or the hard work of the dock dock workers' unions protesting over the course of years. And neither does protest adequately describe the quiet and constant day-to-day -day work of financially supporting your family, of trying to navigate yourself between the various. Uh, Support systems that the government provides, nor does it adequately describe patiently arguing for empathy or better services or better design or better engineering at work. The word I like is resistance. Labius Woods, an architect and professor at,、uh, at Hutada Cooper Union in New York, defined resistance as a measured struggle that is more tactical than strategic. This quote is from something he wrote a few years before he died, called "Architecture and Resistance," and I'd like to just end by reading a couple pieces of it,、uh, as much for you as it is for myself to hear. Resistance is not something that can be improvised at the barricades. It takes time and a lot of trial and error. This is only just because the things to be resisted have not come from nowhere. They have a history built over periods of time, a kind of seriousness and weight that makes them a threat to begin with. They can only be resisted by ideas and notions of equivalent substance and momentum. Resist whatever seems inevitable. Resist people who seem invincible. Resist the hope that you'll get that big job. Resist getting big jobs. Resist taking the path of least resistance. Resist the panicky feeling that you are alone. Resist the desire to move to a different city. Resist the notion that you should never compromise. Resist that feeling of utter exhaustion. Resist the illusion that it is ever complete. Thank you.